when I first came across Troy Reed, I was looking at a Don Diva magazine, and I saw that Troy was doing documentaries on on the hood and street life. And so I was working on a project myself called Parallel Worlds, comparing the prison industrial system with slavery of the past. And so I decided to call Troy up to see if he was interested in doing a project together with me. And I met Troy down on 125th Street, and I showed him the photos that I, that I had received while I was in Rikers Island on adolescents just getting their faces just ripped wide open. And when I saw them, I was bugging because it was like, damn, like, yo, this is, these was pictures of inmates like cut five minutes after they was cut. So that right there just had me like, you know, when he started explaining some of the things that took place in on Rikers Island, some of the things from a CO point of view, that made me like, yo, this is something I gotta do. I, I wanna jump on this. I also explained to them that I also traveled to Ghana and how Ghana, the old slavery, and the prison industrial system is the same system today. When Lorenzo started telling me about being a correction officer in slavery and how he just was looking at it, you know, as combined worlds. And that's something that really like touched me because I was like, damn, I've been to Africa, I've been to Ghana, I've, I've seen the, the slave castles, I've seen the shackles, I've seen all that. And, and, and it, it, it meant a lot to me to make me say, yo, this is something that I definitely got to do because it was all spiritual. Jail, you can't learn in the street. That's learning patience. I just finished doing 10 years up north. I just came home from doing 10 years. I done did 10 years straight. I went in 2016, came home 26. I gave the system about 15 years on my life. I gave these crackers, man, 17 years of my life, man. The prison system gave me 15 of life, and I gave them back 10 years. I did five years out of that. I served 10 years straight up. Um, in them 10 years, I lost everything that I love. My pops, my moms. Can you just imagine going to jail in 1989 and them telling you your release date is on February 2004? It's crazy. I gave the prison system a decade, 10 years of my life, something that I'm never, never get back. In total, I gave the crackers in the penitentiary out of my life it was 15 and a half years, and I'm 41 now. I gave the penal system 15 years, 15 years total. First of all, it started off when I was a juvenile. It started from Sparfit to Rikers Island to the Feds. You see clips, you go up to the next block, you see, you see uh, a blood, and then you go down to the next block, you see Latin Kings. Lock and load. This is the point of no return. I can never go back. Life without parole, upstate, shackled and trapped. Living in the hole, looking at the world through a crack. But fuck that. I'd rather shoot it out and get clapped. I'm it's more jails than schools. It's me. more blacks in Puerto, Puerto Rican, like Latinos, period, like in jails than any Tainos, raping the black and Indian women, creating Latinos. Motherfuckers made me out of self-righteous hatred. And now you got yourself a virus. Stuck I went to Rikers Island. I visited as a member of the Public Safety Committee two years ago. We were literally.
literally animals in prison. We were locked up, we were caged down. We have a group of inmates who have a propensity for violence and they don't care about their fellow inmates, they don't care about a correcting officer. And I saw how many members of the Nietas and the Latin Kings were on the island with beads and colors, and I pointed out then that we had a gang problem. Today's arrests have effectively dismantled the command structure of the Latin King organization. The Bloods also allegedly smuggled drugs to fellow members in jail. The case provides a window into how gangs can come here to New York City. In this case, police say the Rolling 30s Crip set was set up in Belize by a former Los Angeles gang member. When I first got to Rikers Island in 77, it was every man for himself. When you walked in, it's like everything, your whole attitude changed. You became stale to life. They take all your property and give you a set of what you need. In other words, they give you three socks, three underwear, three t-shirts, and a change of clothes. If you come in like you're scared and somebody give him some like, direct eye contact, as soon as you walk in the door, he grilling you. And he drop his head like that, then he know something wrong. You understand? Your ears went numb, your body went numb, your heart started pumping because you never knew what to expect. It all comes down to whether or not you're a Puerto Rican or you're a black man or you're a Crip, if you're a blood, all that is irrelevant. Bottom line, you're going to get tested. When you're in this building, I want you to stay alive to listen carefully to me. Nobody in here is your brother. I don't care if they're as black as you are, as light as daylight. They are not your brother. You mind your business, son, and you'll stay alive. You had COs that was COs, but they wasn't COing, you know what I mean? And us as niggas, we respected their gangster. Police don't really run the house, you know what I'm saying? We run the house. In C-74, they had a thing called segregation. That's where they put all the wild guys in one house. The Harlem dudes, they sit right here. Don't come over here, the Brooklyn dudes over there, and the kids from the Bronx over here. You have to sit right here. If you sit over there, you're gonna have problems. Don't worry about no phone time right now. We'll tell you when you get on the phone when we tell you to. Normally they'll have two phones, so it'll be Hispanic, blacks. It looked like an army base where you got a bed, a locker lined up that way. A bed, a locker going straight down. Multiple beds lined up back to back to back to back, side to side to side to side to side. Everybody got a fucking bunk. 60 semi-individuals on one gallery with one CO. Dealing with 60 different mentalities. And the niggas on the island, you got the wildest niggas from the five boroughs. Back then, we didn't have the Bloods and the Crips back then from the island. They was out in California and all that, yeah, but it wasn't none of that. It was always 5% of, you know what I'm saying? It was the Latin Kings, you know what I'm saying? It was the Nation of Islam, Muslims, you know what I'm saying? New nigga come in the house, he got a shine on. Go get that. When I first went to Rikers Island, I was naive to the whole thing. So when I went to Rikers Island, I went with a dapper dance suit. When you come in, they got bids on you. I could be like over here on my house. I could be right here, and I'm already situated. Right for the whole boy, he's, he's in a bubble. He could be in a bubble talking to the police. I'm going in with a pair of construction boots, brand new, fresh. Same day I copped them. I go to sleep. When I wake up, dudes go in my locker and they take my shit. I'm off the rip. I'm like, I'm already telling my homies in there, like, yo, see what I'm saying? Those are mine. You know what I'm saying? Niggas already claiming them shits. He wanted my lumberjack shirt and my British walkers. Dude don't even know it's popping. You know what I'm saying? But I'm, everybody in the radio house already know you're like, dude, 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 because everybody get on the gate like, oh shit, the jacket is hot, it's me. And you believe the kid got the nerves to put my boots on and go to sleep with my boots on. So a nigga try to stick me up in my suit, he try to talk me out of my suit. He's saying, if I don't give up my suit, I'm going to get hurt in so many words. So me, I stole a nigga. Nine times out of ten, if you fold during that test, you will be nothing. Everything that you have, the value, will be belonging to someone else. You will never know a moment's peace. You will always be the wreck of that prison. That same jewelry I wear now, if I wear a $50,000 watch, you know what I'm saying? A Jacob now, and you know, God forbid, I go to jail tomorrow, I, and I got this $20,000 ring on, I'm gonna wear that tomorrow, I'm gonna wear it in jail. You know what I'm saying? It's just like they recognize, you know what I'm saying? You come through there, if you's a real nigga, you ain't got nothing to worry about, like shit all gonna come to you. This is where you gotta show whether you a warrior or you a slouch, you know what I mean? The island is just, is just gladiator school, right over, it's just gladiator school. Getting you ready for that, for up north, you know what I mean? Fighting, stabbing. On the island, you for dolo, ain't no ratchets, you ain't sending no slugs long distance. All that, yo, I'm good with the razor, but not good with the hands. Family, if you can't box, you can't cut a nigga fight. Niggas was doing the 52 shit. Niggas had the shit all down to the knees. When the first nigga tried me, I made a, a not, not an example out of him, but instead of getting a Grammy, I got an Oscar. 
I seen niggas coming there with a one and three on the island. I couldn't be humble there. I had to be an animal. I had to literally become a beast. Slaves, look at this shit, man. Slaves, B. Come up in there, we gonna rip your fucking head off. Who's able to get somebody 25 years for uh, pulling a raise out on someone and extorting them and stealing from them? So, doing from a year, now you're doing 25 years. <laughs> and, and, and wind up with 30 years, 25. All jail cases. First thing I had was a pen in my motherfucking hand. And that little big pen I took, that shit went through his eye, went through his jaw. I motherfucking severed the nigga shit. Then after I finished stabbing the nigga, that wasn't enough. I had to starve the nigga out, drag him, drag him, then rob him. As soon as you come through, no matter if you gangster or not, niggas gonna test you. Money got it and I need it, I'm coming for it. Besides, the there's two type of men. Those who carry the whip and those who carry the bag. One is a strong, one is weak. The strong man gonna survive, the weak man gonna have to pay the price. Bottom line. I was on my way, I'm going to C-74, I'm 16, so I gotta go to C-74. That's where they house the adolescents at and shit. And you know, adolescents is the niggas that wig out the most. Razors, bangers, and all this crazy shit. You know, it's a different feel. You know, I grew up in Sparfit, and I mean, ain't nothing for a little fight or nothing. But now you step into a whole new league where it's razors and bangers now, know what I mean? And there's niggas that's out there, they just looking for a rep. You good with your hands, that's nice, but when a nigga back that matawak out on you, that's gonna stop everything real fast. Wait a minute, homie, pass that off. You got somebody sleeping in they bunk. You wanna get at him, you, he right there, he sleep. You wrap some tissue around his feet, clown a nigga, whatever you wanna do to the nigga. Clown him, burn his feet, make him wash the clothes. You can see which one is the weak one. Sometimes if they so weak, you gotta get them out of it. Cause something is going to happen to him. Because one nigga, we birthday, we birthday cake the nigga toes and shit. Like his toes are sticking from under the blanket and shit. So we birthday cake this shit, boom, boom, put mad tissue on this shit. Boom, lit the shit on fire. This nigga, you know, and he ain't get all wild and jump up like everybody else. He just pulled his feet under the covers. So we like, oh, we had to run and dive in our bed. Like, oh shit, cause this is a dawn. This is like, um, um, Mar, it's Mar 4. Mar 4, so you know, it's dorms and shit. So we just run and jump in my uh, bed. Like, oh, this nigga about to burn the fuck up, B, this nigga. Niggas like, nah, fuck that. Run over there and stomp the nigga out. You know, you gotta stomp a fire out. He just niggas just up. started stomping him out. Other niggas that don't got their props, they not touching that jack. That's crazy. They, they not, don't even think about it. Don't even wish about it. I roll in, I say, nigga, who running the phone? Yeah. That's my first question. Who the fuck runs the phone? Wherever I went, I had that mic. And that's gangster. Wherever I went, let, let me reiterate that again. Wherever I went, I controlled that mic. Yeah, believe that. Man, I see niggas get killed on that jack, man. I seen one time I one time a nigga when police, when CEOs went to do the count. I always kicked the bed. And the guy didn't move. So we kept kicking the bed. The guy was laying up there dead. There was a nigga missing underneath the, 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 the bed. He was leaking. They had, they, they had stuffed him underneath the bed with, with blankets over him. And he was leaking. And I'm like, you know, and I'm, I know a nigga dead, but the nigga underneath the bunk. So that's when the squad came up. They killed the nigga over the jack. Now the first thing I do when I walk up in there, you know what I mean? I'm the master of deception. I go up in that motherfucker, and the first thing I'ma do is see who's rocking that shit. I'ma tell the nigga, yo, give me five minutes on the phone just to let my people know where I'm at. And once I do that, that's it. I'm not even unpacking my bag. That phone goes with me in my back pocket. Now, whoever's gangsta, whoever got time on that phone, and who got prime time, I'm controlling. Even if I ain't got nobody to call, I want that mic. Why? Because that's a sense of control, and I'm a control freak. It is prohibited for you to get on that fucking phone and touch that jacket. Yeah, niggas get banged out in the shower. Niggas get banged not talking on the telephone. Niggas get banged not coming from the visit, going to the visit, coming from commissary, coming from the mess hall, walking down the hall.